welcome back to the 119th episode of the Daily Flip Podcast. I'm your host, Alex, and today we're going to be flipping through some of the top stories, including will the GOP ever get past Trump and some of the sycophants who are still in the party trying to appeal to his base. The deal for the debt ceiling has been at least tentatively made, so we'll talk about that and some of the reactions as well as some advice for the Democratic Party coming from the Daily Cost writers. And, of course, we will end today with our daily delight, a story meant to leave you feeling positive and ready to take on the day. Now, that's enough rambling from me. Let's jump in to our daily debate. Can the Republican Party move past Trump? You know, it's going to be part of our first article, and it's been a conversation that has been going on for a long time. Is he going to go down in history as a Reagan-like figure, or is he going to fall out of history and be a loathed moment in the party? These are all questions that we don't have the answers to yet, and they loom large in some of the Republicans' minds and some of the Democrats' minds. So let me know what you think down in the comment section. I'd love to hear what you have to say. All right, let's jump to our first article that comes from the Daily Beast. GOP Senate candidates who want to forget about their past Trump criticisms. So from the headline, you can tell where they're coming from. These are, you know, people who are going for a vital position, maybe a senatorial race, maybe they're having a House race coming up here soon, and they in the past have criticized Trump. They've come after him. They said, oh, no, one of these policies that you're putting forward, it is unacceptable, President Trump. We will not have it. And now they're flip-flopping because they realize, oh, wow, he has a lot of primary voters. He has a strong turnout rate in the base. And while going a little bit further to the right or going towards the Trump MAGA Republicans as the slur, I would call it a slur nowadays, not trying to be mean, but I feel like it's kind of thrown around like, oh, those MAGA Republicans. But in order to entice them, you kind of have to play to their wants and their needs in the primary. But then when you get to the general, that doesn't normally play so well. So a lot of people are trying to walk that fine line. And if they're not outright saying, oh, I support Trump and his movement, they're trying to take back some of their criticisms and, you know, moderate themselves or at least appear more moderate and less centrist in the primaries. We'll see how that works out for them. Let's jump to our first quote here, talking about one candidate in particular. Quote, in 2016, Bernie Moreno sounded like a lot of Republicans who were aghast to the prospect of Donald Trump becoming president. A wealthy and politically active Ohio businessman, Moreno had immigrated from Colombia to the United States as a child and was outraged by Trump's rhetoric on immigration. Six years later, of course, many of Trump's fiercest critics have become his strongest allies. But as his legal woes and political baggage mount, uh, many at the top of the Republican officials, candidates, and donors are anxious to move on. Marino is not one of them. As he launched his campaign to unseat Senator Sherrod Brown, Democrat of Ohio, the one-time Trump apostate, has cloaked himself in MAGA regalia and his backing of Trump's 2024 campaign is his cultivation of the Trump world figures to even his once firm stance on immigration. So not necessarily the juiciest quote there, but you can see the, the sense of what they're getting at. And I'll elaborate further on Moreno. He was very, very against a lot of the immigration policies that Trump was putting forward. And he was a big supporter of the DACA program. And as you know, Trump practically gutted DACA. And whether you agree with it or disagree with it, it was something that caused a lot of divisive conversations, to put it nicely. There, let's just say there are lots of Twitter feuds about it. And now Moreno's coming down and saying, oh, no, 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 some of his immigration policies weren't that bad. The thing about the article here is they never say that he outright supports the taking away of DACA privileges from citizens when Trump did it, or he they don't say that he does it now. Oh, yeah, in in hindsight, 
I didn't like the fact that he was taking away DACA then, but I'm totally for it now. They never say that. But they do speak about the other immigration issues that Trump brought up with a stronger border, the amount of migrants coming in, maybe keeping Title 42 in place. And I think it's a little unfair from the Daily Beast because they don't outright say it, but they do imply that he's made a full flip-flop. And maybe he's made a half flip-flop. But there's no doubt here that he is still appealing to the MAGA base. Now, why is this? Why do they still want that base or need that base so badly? I discussed a little bit about it at the beginning, but Trump has revitalized or maybe even swayed some blue-collar workers, some more ground of the earth, salt of the earth is the phrase I should have used there, salt of the earth, hard-working people who either didn't vote in primaries before or maybe voted in an independent or Democrat primary, and he swayed them over to the Republican side of the aisle. And they are very active in these primary votes. So you have a lot of maybe the college-educated Republicans. You have some of the other strands of Republicans, the libertarian Republicans, whatever you want to do, the economically free market, or maybe like your Rand Paul, you have those Republicans as well who may not be as active in the primary process. So a lot of these candidates are saying, okay, let's, let's face reality here. I need to get through the primary first. We can't worry about the general until the primary. And it, my opponent, he's a little bit more moderate. And maybe he has some of the bigger donors. So I'm going to go the populist route. I'm going to appeal to the MAGA voters and maybe get an endorsement from President Trump. Now, we saw in 2022 that did not work out for a lot of the candidates that Trump endorsed. A lot of people saw them in the general election as too radical. But we can't, or the Republican Party cannot, they're looking at, oh, well, how am I going to get through the primary, and how am I going to get through the general? And there's two different groups that need to reapproach this. There are the people running, which is, I need to be electable in the general not just am I electable in the primary, am I electable in the general election? And if you go for a more MAGA base, there is so much hatred, vitriol, and a lot of contempt there from a lot of different voters of the brand of Donald Trump that maybe you shouldn't go hard for this MAGA stuff in the primary because they're gonna, they are going to take the clips from you at rallies talking with these MAGA talking points and then run them as ads. So maybe you should think about that. And then the other side that needs to think about electability is the voters. Why do you want to have someone who is a MAGA Republican if they can't even put in place those MAGA points of view because they won't get elected? I, you know, maybe there's some cases like J.D. Vance. He's a MAGA Republican, as they would probably call him. And but the thing is, he was still moderate enough that he was able to sway the independents and a few Democrats to come to his side. If, as a political party, the Republicans just keep nominating more MAGA figures who do not have the greatest success rate, then they should not be surprised when they actually can't get what they want done. They need to think about electability. Maybe you should stop just voting for MAGA for MAGA's sake and actually think, okay, this other guy, he's a little bit more moderate, but he still talks about some of the issues I care about, and he can affect the grand plan if you have one or two extra Senate seats, especially nowadays when things are really tight in the Senate, or if you have maybe 10 extra House Republican seats. Overall, the legislation that they're going to pass is going to be Republican-leaning in nature or conservative-leaning in nature, and maybe that will give it a better chance of actually encompassing issues that you care about even if the person that you're voting for doesn't talk about all of them in the same way that you would like them to. So maybe there needs to be a cultural shift there. Because I think the Democrats, they are having a little bit of a crisis with this too. Some places are putting forward very progressive candidates coming out of the primary, and they're losing to very moderate Republicans. And that's not to say that people don't want progressive politics. Obviously, the primary voters want it, but the general population is sitting there like, whoa, 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 okay. We don't want all these MAGA policies. Maybe it's because we don't agree with the policies themselves. Maybe it's just because we don't like Trump and his brand of politics. And on the other side, they're looking at these progressive policies 
and some of the progressive politicians saying, we don't like your brand of politics. So we're having these two, maybe even three separate worlds. We have the primaries and then we have, I don't want to say the real world, but the general. And everybody's operating in different rules in different locations. The rule should be who is electable. And normally the electable people are the more moderate people. Because I'm sorry to tell you, no matter what the polls say, American people are very, very moderate in the center. Maybe in some areas they lean a little bit more to the right. Maybe in some areas they lean a little bit more to the left. But there's a lot more that connects us than pulls us apart. So let's get back to the point of this article. So why are the Republicans having such a hard time pulling away from Trump? And we have a quote directly from the article from an insider. Quote, Trump remains the political center of gravity for the Republican Party, said GOP strategist Ken Spain. Candidates facing potential primaries are clearly looking to reignite themselves with the base. Quote, take Governor Jim Justice, the frontrunner to take Senator Joe Manchin's seat. A former Democrat, Justice was vocal as a backer of Trump and then cooled on the former president in 2020 deriding his performance as the presidential in the presidential debates and decrying the January 26th attack on the U.S. Capitol. Now facing a GOP primary, Justice is more effusive than ever in his praise and support for Trump. He called his criminal indictment in Manhattan court a travesty that shows the lack of, quote, lack of respect towards the commitment and accomplishments that President Trump has given us, end quote. He even extended a thank you on behalf of West Virginia to the Trump family, quote, especially my hunting buddies, Don Jr. and Eric, end quote. So there's also an aspect here that you can see that the Trump family has not just, oh, they just come into politics and they're just going to sit here, do their thing and get out. No, they have different people that have become ingrained in politics. You look at Don Jr., you look at Eric, you see a lot of different podcast clips of them talking about the conservative movement. They haven't just come in to this conversation to get the political power, or maybe they have, but that would be a little bit naive of me to say, oh, they just did it for the political power. But they've come into this conversation, they've brought their worldview, they've brought policy issues, and they are trying to say, no, no, we're here for the long run. We care about America. We want America to succeed. And they've ingrained themselves in this political process. And Trump has done the same thing. He, when you get out of office, normally, then again, it is different if you want to run again. But normally, presidents take a back seat. They go and enjoy their golf courses. They do their reading tours, their speech tours, where they make a whole bunch of money speaking at different locations. And Trump has still done some of that. But he has had a fire in his belly to get back to the White House. So he has still been on the political stage all this time not necessarily directing politics like a mastermind, but still setting the stage and setting the narrative. So, yeah, to some degree, he is the political center of the right at this point. And that's why I brought up in the daily debate. Is he going to be a Reagan-like figure? Is he going to go down in history as someone who reoriented the party or brought them into the modern day and taught them how to fight again and how to win again? Or is he going to be left to the annals of history. And as we move on, we'll say, oh yeah, remember those those four years or maybe those f- two separate four-year terms that were you know, kind of weird and they kind of pissed off everybody in Washington when the president was in? We'll see which one of those he goes down as. I'm going to say, and I think you know, maybe it's a little bit naive of me to say, I think that he's going to go down as the the former, he's going to go down as a Reagan-like figure because he was always president present in the U.S. conversation anyway. I mean, he was famous for years upon years. Then he became a president. That alone will not be forgotten. But then he spent years reorienting the party, whether the party had realized it at the time or not. He is going to be in the history books, and if a left person writes it, he's going to be the evil, evil demon who took over politics in the United States in 2016. And if the right person wrote it, he may even still be the evil devil that destroyed Washington politics in 2016. But either way, he's going down in history. And I think the Republicans need to accept that, but there is a movement to move on. And I do think that for their political benefit, they need to move past him. 
We'll see what this next election brings, maybe another four years of Trump. But after that, if he still has too much sway within the party, then the Republicans are going to have to seriously think about having to cut ties in a really formal way and outright say, no, hey, President Trump, thank you for all you did. Thank you for all the wins. In you know, you gave us a lot of BS to deal with in the media, but thank you for all the wins. But we're moving on now. Thank you very much. All right, so let's jump to our second article. This one comes from Fox News. Lawmakers react to debt ceiling deal reached between House GOP and Biden. So, of course, we know that the debt ceiling is a very hot topic right now. And Janet Yellen just said, you know, it's actually not June 1st. No, you have a little bit more time. We can make it until about June 5th. So today is Tuesday, and that today is when the new bill that has the different caving, the cave-ins of either side, the concessions. Oh, that's the official word. Thank you for my brain for working there. So this new bill with the concessions from both sides is going to go through the House committee today before it can go on to the floor and then be voted upon. So we'll have a good idea of what's going on by the 5th, hopefully. And it's interesting when you look back, you saw McCarthy coming to the table saying, hey, we already passed a deal. Now you need to come and sit down. And Biden was like, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. I want a clean debt ceiling. And then as some polling came in, and this is my this is my cynical view. There was some polling that probably came in from the Democrats or the White House polling groups, and they said, hey, sir, sir, the American people know that McCarthy put a bill on the table and that you outright refusing looks really bad, and you're probably going to get blamed if this thing doesn't go through. And so they're coming to the table. What I think would be really interesting and what I think would have happened if the polls said something opposite, if Joe Biden had found that the American people were actually on his side and thought that he wouldn't be responsible for the debt ceiling and believed that the Republicans were really the ones holding up the process, like was thrown out there in the media by so many different you know, journalistic institutions, then maybe he wouldn't have budged. Maybe he would have stayed strong. But like I said, I think some internal polling came in. You know, that's just my speculation. I don't know for sure. Maybe he had it deep down in his heart that he really cared about this issue. He wanted to make sure that Americans don't lose their jobs, that federal employees don't get some of their spending cut. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Who knows? But I think there was some internal polling because that's how a lot of politics works ever since the Cheney era. Just lots and lots of polling to figure out what the people want at any given time. So let's jump to our first quote. Quote, Washington leaders responded on Sunday to Bipartisan Fiscal Responsibility Act, a deal reached between House Speaker Kevin McCarthy and President Biden to evade defaulting on the country's financial obligations. Both McCarthy and Biden held their po posture as long as they could while a looming deadline of June 5th and on Sunday reached a final agreement with just days to spare. Quote, the Fiscal Responsibility Act does what it is responsible, what is responsible for our kids, what is possible in divided government, and what is required of our principles. McCarthy said this on Twitter, and I do like the last part of the tweet. Quote, Republicans resolve, achieve this transformative change to how Washington works. End quote. I'm sorry, McCarthy. This is not this is not a revolutionary change to Washington. This is not the ultimate bill that reigns in all the spending. No, you're keeping spending to the previous year's levels. You're cutting some discretionary spending and you're also locking in some military spending. This is not revolutionary. This is just a normal deal. And I understand he has to frame it a particular way and I get that his ops team or his media team is probably like okay, this is how you have to frame it. We're going to have this tweet go out. We're going to talk about how the Republicans standing strong, being a solid unit at this moment, really allowed for us to get this deal done with the White House. I understand that he has to do that for messaging purposes. But it, come on, my guy, it is not that revolutionary. This is a discussion that happens maybe every other year or every three years when you have a House or a Senate that is the opposite party of the president. These negotiations happen. Everybody claws back what they can. They take or they add different programs that they think are important. 
and then we move on. This is not majorly historic. This is something that should have been resolved a while ago. And I'm not putting that you on you, McCarthy. Let's be clear. I don't think you're listening to this. And if you are, thank you for joining me, House Speaker. Very nice of you to listen to a constituent who cares about these issues. But it's not that, that big of a deal. Okay? Don't toot your own horn too much. You did a good thing. You did the responsible thing. But it's not uh, revolutionary. But th- thank you for getting Biden to the table, at least. You know, that that's what I'll say to you, because a default would be terrible for absolutely everybody. And also give credit to President Biden for sitting down and negotiating with McCarthy, even though he said he wouldn't. And there were lots of critics saying you should use the 14th Amendment. You got to give him credit where it's due. He came down. He decided to negotiate. We may not agree with everything that either side put on the table or took off the table, but at least they were able to do this. And this is my hopeful side, not my cynical side. At least they were able to do this for the American people. So let's go to some of the other thoughts that were shared by other leaders, like uh, Senator McConnell. Quote, Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell of Kentucky issued a statement in response to the agreement on Sunday evening. Quote, the United States of America will not default on its debt, he said. Today's agreement makes an urgent makes urgent progress towards preserving our nation's full faith and credit and a much needed step towards getting its financial house in order. End quote. McConnell added that he was grateful for McCarthy and other House Republicans for working to ensure the debt limit increase includes steps in to rein in the reckless spending of Democrats in Washington, D.C. End quote. And what you'll notice here is a lot of these comments so far are very, very general. Oh, we've done the, the greatest spending reduction, or we've done the most responsible thing for the American people, or, oh, thank you for reining in the Democrats' uh, crazy spending. These are very general statements. And I think this is because Republicans had to cave on a lot, and they didn't necessarily get a lot of what they wanted in this deal. So they have to just frame it in a very simple manner. Thank you for reining it in. It also makes it easy for messaging. Hey, thank you for reining in the Democrats' reckless spending. Thank you for standing strong and representing the Republican Party in a good light. I think that's, you know, it's simpler to do it that way, and it allows their message to get out there, and also then they don't have to talk about the particulars, which some people may not care about anyway. But, you know, it's a very surface level, like, oh, yeah, thank you for getting the debt ceiling passed. Uh, it should have been done a while ago, but thank you for doing it. So I don't really think McConnell, he obviously supports McCarthy, but he's out here like, okay, guys, can we move on now? This topic is getting so annoying. And as we get closer to the deadline, just get this up to us in the Senate and we'll pass it. No problems. But, you know, there's not, all, not everybody is 100% behind what was passed. And some of the Freedom Caucus members have come out and made some comments. And, of course, you, Hakeem Jeffries, the minority leader in the House, he also had some words for it. Quote, But not all Republican House members are ready to jump in celebration because of the deal, including Lauren Boebert, who posted on Twitter earlier in the day, quote, The usual establishment people are popping champagne over this debt ceiling deal. It's more worthy of Bud Light, end quote. And then House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries also tweeted earlier in the day, quote, thankful that President Biden has reached an agreement in principle to prevent a devastating GOP manufacturer default. Look forward to reviewing the legislative bill text once it is released this afternoon and continuing our work to put people over politics, end quote. So honestly, it sounds like he's just giving a speech. He's just trying to say, okay, how can I take advantage of this? How can I, you know, boost my numbers? Oh, yeah, let's talk about how this is more about the people than politics. And that's my cynical side coming out again. And Bobert's tweet is actually kind of funny. You know, it's more deserving of a, a Bud Light than a Champagne. Well, obviously, we know the conservatives right now do not like Bud Light. So I think her point is taken well. But, you know, it's not all roses. And you're never going to get all roses in Washington. Both sides are never going to get exactly what they want. And the fact that people are complaining about that, the fact that Hakeem Jeffries is saying this is a manufactured default, to some degree, I guess that argument is true. The Republicans could have put forward a clean debt ceiling limit. But also, have you noticed the inflation going on? Have you noticed the large amount of government spending along with increasing prices from companies? 
These are two different aspects of the inflation game that are going on. And some would argue that p- companies are price gouging a little bit more. And I think that's an interesting perspective. And they keep saying, well, these companies have record profits. And I keep asking myself, well, are they record profits or are they non-inflation adjusted profits? And then what, if they come back to me with that data, because I have not been able to find any data of the case, if that data comes back to me and I'm proven wrong, then yes, I'll say, okay, these companies are price gouging and that's a huge reason for inflation. But we also can't deny that if the government is spending a lot of money, that means there's probably more money in the money supply, therefore decreasing the value of every dollar that is out there. So we can see that we actually need to cut back a little bit of spending on the federal side. Anything we can do to ease inflation rather than just raise interest rates like the Fed has been doing. So I think clawing back some spending is a good idea, and it's a responsible thing. So when Hakeem Jeffries says is a manufacturer default, he's not wrong to some degree. Like I said, they could have just outright passed it. But if you're looking at the long-term stability of the nation rather than the short-term pleasure of just getting this debt ceiling issue fixed, then maybe cutting back some spending was actually a smart thing for the Republicans and McCarthy to do. All right, let's jump to our last article. This one comes from Daily Kos. And the author starts, the well, the title of the author, article is my advice to the democratic party leadership so this author obviously has lots of opinions on what should happen and we're going to i'll pull out two quotes here and we're going to talk about one how the representative process has kind of gone astray in the united states and then the advice that he would give in order to solve one of the major issues that he sees with the current process Quote, the real danger to democracy is that it's facing a serious credibility crisis. I think this is very true, especially in this country. For most of my adult life, I have been aware that our representative government does not necessarily represent the people who vote for the representatives. Instead, it tends to mostly represent those who make large campaign contributions to the election campaigns of those representatives. So what we often witness is a huge rhetorical show about being in the corner of the average show, While behind the scenes, through action and often inaction, the opposite seems to always happen. The well-off, the wealthy, and above all of them, the gratuitously wealthy, seem to always get their way. End quote. And, you know, there there is a certain part of me that is a little bit cynical about the process here in America that agrees that the common person is not fully represented by their representatives in Congress. Now, of course, there are those who are fully grassroots supported, only take small dollar donations that are not able to get in and only care about their representatives. And then, of course, there are the other ones who take a whole bunch of money from lobbying firms and they still weigh the concerns of their people that they are representing very highly over those lobbying firms. And then, of course, there are the ones who are just bought out by the lobbying firms or big dollar donors. So I think there's a mix of everybody. And I'm not going to outright say that overall it's only the wealthy people who are contributing and getting their point of view heard. But there are a lot, a lot of wealthy people who influence the American political system. And very often they do get what they want. And sometimes that can be for the betterment of people around them or just the common everyday man. But, you know a lot of the time it is just to their benefit or at least more in their benefit. But I think the author misses out something really important here, which is the fact that NGOs who don't necessarily give money to candidates have a lot of political sway nowadays. They have the ability to go out on Twitter and be outraged and make a whole kerfuffle about certain issues and really press lawmakers to do something. And sometimes lawmakers just pay lip service and sometimes lawmakers actually go out and put into place policies that these NGOs are talking or they are calling for. And with Twitter, a small minority of people can inundate representatives and show, hey, we really care about this issue. We may not be your largest constituency, but we're going to be loud and vocal about the fact that you're not helping on this issue and we're going to tell all your other voters. So I think there is a mix I think for the, a long time, it has been a lot of big dollar donors have an outsized influence. But now that a lot of people have direct messaging to the representatives of the government, 
and the NGOs are gaining a lot of steam because of the internet and their growing influence on the political stage. I think that this is still true, but it falls a little bit on deaf ears in that things are changing, and it's not just big money. It's just any big organization, whether it have big money or not. But of course, when it comes down to it, money does talk. So we can't deny that. And lobbying firms have been a part of the D.C. process for a long time, and they're there for a reason. Because the money that the donors give to the lobbyists to lobby their point of view, to get their different amendments passed or added to different bills, it obviously works. Otherwise, lobbying would not be a successful industry. So what is the advice? Because the author does go on to talk about how there's a problem with the court and how it has a six to three supermajority. And I think it's interesting that this word supermajority is being thrown around. No, no, not a supermajority, just a majority. Guess what a supermajority would be? Nine to zero. That's a supermajority. Or maybe even eight to one would be a supermajority. But seven to two, three to six, five to four, no, those are just majorities. And I think it's this, because it's a consistent theme on a lot of people that I read who are left-wing articles. I think it's very interesting that now this term supermajority, 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 to make it seem over the top, really large majority that you can never get past. I think that it's an intentional rhetorical battle that's going on here in order to influence some of the readers. But that's beyond the point. So what does the author want to do in order to overturn the supermajority? Well, he wants to raise the number from the nine justices to a fixed point of 13 and never change it from now on. And he wants to give term limits to the new justices. So anyone who's on the court right now will serve out the life sentence, or sentence is the wrong word. They will serve on the court for life or until they want to retire. And then... For the next people that come in, the extra four that he's saying that should be added, they'll have 18 years on the court. And anyone that is nominated after that will have 18 years on the court. This is in order to make sure that turnover is always happening and that at the end of the day, we're getting fresh perspectives. We're not just having a judge who was elected in 1980 still telling us what to do or what these certain laws actually mean or how they're interpreted 50 years later. That's his argument. And I think it's interesting that this argument comes up now that the Democrats, in theory, could get these judges put on the court. And my argument would be, okay, I think that maybe you have a little bit of something going on here, but I think it's also very politically motivated. So how about this? How about we say only after the next election the next president, can we add those four justices? And because of that, we tell the voters, this is a key issue. This is what is on the ballot. It's not just about who's president, but it's also who is going to have the power to put four more judges on the court that will be there for 18 years. And then we'll, I would allow it at that point. I think at this point, it would just be a power grab saying, okay, yeah, we're going to raise it to 13, but then we're going to fix it so it can never be raised again. So it never gives Republicans the opportunity to come in and say, okay, well, you raised the amount of justices on the court. Why don't we do the same thing? I feel like it's very politically motivated. So I think as a mitigation measure and a show of good faith, say, hey, whoever the next president is gets to decide that. And then I would agree to it. And I would say, okay, if Joe Biden gets in, then obviously the people, they understood that this was on the ballot. They really wanted some more Democratic justices. And if the people get a Republican into office, they'll say, okay, hey, they obviously really care about the justice system being a conservative court. And we'll see how that pans out. I think that's a nice middle ground. And that's the only way I would ever agree to something like this, because otherwise it is just political gerrymandering of the Supreme Court. And I think, I don't think this issue is actually going to come up, but if Republicans are asked on it, I think maybe that's a solution they could put out there and see if there's any pushback. And if the Democrats agree, then maybe you made a strategic mistake because you probably don't want to give up your conservative court if there's a Democrat next time. But I think it, it would be an interesting test to just see if the Democrats are proposing this in good faith or they're proposing it because they just want the power to put on four more justices that agree with them. All right, let's jump to our daily delight. This one comes from the animal rescue site. Cat and turtles snuggle up 
for a midday nap. You know, everybody needs a nap every once in a while, and sometimes it's better with another person or a partner. Quote, one turtle-cat duo are showing that it's not only possible for cats and turtles to be cohabitable, but they're showing that they can be friends. A video shared on Facebook by Nutrition Strength shows the incredible friendship formed between a pet cat and a turtle. And honestly, good on the turtle for being able to deal with, sorry, the cat for being able to deal with the turtle's uncomfortable, unconforming dimensions. That would be a little bit tricky in my mind, and I don't know if I would be able to do it. Quote, the turtle is comfortably, comfortably laying in a makeshift bed while the cat does his best to snuggle up around the amphibian, end quote. And if you want to see any of the cute photos or videos from this article, or you want to read any of today's articles, there's a link in the description below, the like and subscribe button, where you can find the, all of that, as well as the links to the podcast on Spotify, Pocket Cast, Google Podcasts, Podvine, and the Twitter handle, at your daily flip, where I post links directly to the YouTube video on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And with all that said, there's only one more thing to say. Stay safe. Don't die.